Awesome. There we go. Well, I first wanted to say I'm Sean Hansen. Thank you all for sticking with me. I have had a really low spoons week, and then that combined with my first talk ever is pretty nerve-wracking, but I'm super excited to be here. UltraConf is my absolute favorite conference in the entire world, and I never thought that I'd actually be here speaking, so I'm pretty thrilled. But let's dig in. So this is what I look like from within my communities. In the communities that I am part of, it's visible that I work with cloud mon or monitoring on MongoDB. I exist in largely queer and queer adjacent spaces like LGBTQ in tech. Right now, AlterConf, which is awesome, and out in tech. And then I also freelance with a web cooperative named Little Weaver Web on projects that involve music theory. But even more important to this, in these spaces, I get to be open about my life as a queer neurodivergent programmer, and I'm even really privileged to be able to be out about that in the workplace. In particular, I'm out about preferring to be called queer over gay. I'm out about my disability, which is PTSD, dissociative subtype, and the fact that I deal with anxiety and panic on a daily basis. Um, I'm out about using both he, him, and they, them, because the intersections of gender and dissociation are really complex. And I get to be open about my passion for peer-run support groups that provide mental health resources to people regardless of insurance. But this is what I look like outside of my community. And this is what I look like outside of my community in tech. That's not much. And also, you'll see it ends in December because I haven't had any contributions since last December. Um, but all of this is just to say that I'm effectively invisible to recruiters. I'm effectively invisible to hiring managers because I'm distilled down in their eyes to only open source community engagement. And that's not my community. And so that got me thinking, why is community engagement de facto open source contribution? If that's what community engagement means, then whose community is this really? Because it's not mine. And if that's community engagement, then why is contribution the only form of engagement? Are there other things that we do in life? Why are those suddenly invalid? And then if that's community engagement, who are we excluding right here, right now? Who, by defining value in open source contributions, have we just erased? So I want to take a quick roadmap for what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to first define a term called quiet developers, which is kind of a group of people that we'll talk about shortly. And then I want to ask, how are these quiet developers impacted by current hiring practices? What are ways that managers and colleagues can empower us as quiet developers? And then finally, through addressing all of these, I can ask myself and all of us for an ongoing conversation, how do we redefine what community engagement means? So let's jump in with quiet developers. Um, beforehand, I read this article by Scott Hanselman in 2012 called Dark Matter Developers, which was really popular, and mostly talked about engineers that work with older technologies never get the opportunity to work with the latest stacks or libraries or frameworks. And like dark matter in astrophysics, although I don't know astrophysics, so please could, you know, tell me whatever I need to know after this for sure, um, he wrote that engineers are pretty much invisible to the eye, but their presence is felt and inescapable and that their work represents the vast majority of all engineering work, but otherwise has no visibility. And at a glance by a hiring manager or recruiter, especially in relation to the most upcoming technologies, these people either effectively don't exist at all, or if they do exist, they appear like they're willfully disconnected from what's going on in the world. And similarly, I've even seen executives and managers at my previous companies separate out this dark development work with emerging technology and give the older work to outsource teams, which are largely underpaid, underappreciated mi racial minorities in other countries, while giving the things that could potentially boost a career visibly to their in-house devs, which are more than likely made up predominantly of white men. And so I wanted to take this a little bit further and talk about a quiet developer, because I think there are a lot of individ or individuals out here who are basically invisible because of their work, but are still quite smart and really want to know all about the newest technologies and whatever's interesting to them. But for other reasons, they just don't have the opportunity to code outside of work. Um, our work as quiet developers is important and worthwhile, I think, but it's not necessarily ever going to be visible outside of our direct employers. And it may be the case that we find maintaining a personal brand is really aggravating or, in the case of some of us, actually dangerous for us. So I wanted to start by listing a couple factors of what might cause a quiet developer to avoid coding outside of work. Um, we've got day-to-day -day discrimination and harassment, visible and invisible disabilities, 
overly demanding and sometimes abusive workplaces, um, long commute length or being located completely in a different area from work, caring for dependents, which can be people of all ages, not just children and elders, language barriers, and the fact that many employers do not respect English as a second, third, fourth, fifth, or so on language, abusive OSS experiences they've had online or abusive experiences in general that they've had, observation of religious practices and outstanding debt or financial insecurity, especially with the brutal combination that many people are also underpaid. So um, these issues disproportionately impact women, queer people of all genders and people of color. And when you are already undervalued and underpaid, and especially when you feel unsafe in or outside of your employer's workspace, additional work outside your nine to five also means performing a lot more unpaid emotional labor. And of course, people can have interest in literally anything they want other than software development. You, don't, you do not need an excuse. And more than that, regardless of circumstance, people are never obligated to structure their entire lives around their employers. People do not need an excuse to avoid additional work or contribute to OSS. People don't need an excuse for why work is not their top priority. And in light of this, they still deserve to be treated as competent, capable individuals regardless. And this means, also on a side, that you can't judge open source contributions as a strictly positive bonus when you're looking at people, because if you're going to give a bonus to certain groups of people but not others, that's not a bonus. That's really shitty. <laughs> um, um, so a little bit about hiring in quiet developers. Um, the list of reasons why developers might not be coding outside of work sounds really familiar to me for some reason, and maybe some of you all because it's pretty much illegal to ask candidates about all of those issues. And I apologize for a giant wall of text that's gonna come up here, but I wanna lay, uh, or I want to lay out exactly the things that are illegal in the US for a recruiter or hiring manager to ask about, because I really wish I had had this three, four, five years ago. Um, so we have age, we have primary spoken or written language, religious practices or observation, membership in social organizations and clubs, marriage or parental status or other family relationships, gender identity, sexual orientation, alcohol, tobacco use, or any other legal drug usage, including your current usage, um, past illegal drug use or history of recovery programs, disability status, again, both physical and mental health, prescription drugs, history or of upcoming medical procedures, commute length, distance from work, and anything pretty much about your finances. Um, I put student and other debt because that's relevant for me, but literally anything about your finances. It's no one's business except your own. And yet it seems like open source contributions too often for recruiters serve as a proxy to these questions. By relying on work that's curated during free time, hiring managers and recruiters use community engagement pretty much the same way that they're already using cultural fit, which is to say no to employees that they legally shouldn't be able to dismiss but will want to. Um, so the bottom line for recruiters and hiring managers to me is this, filtering out prospective employees by OSS virtually guarantees a homogenous candidate pool. And if you have a homogenous candidate pool, there's no way that you can hire with diversity and inclusion in mind. Um, another caveat, I really like caveats, I think there are like three or four in this deck. Um, it is never the responsibility of a marginalized individual to fix or confront the structures that oppress them. Simply existing and fighting to survive in society is a form of resistance and ultimately, we have to preserve our own health, safety, and well-being before we can resist further. Another one is bootstrap rhetoric is toxic. And by this, I mean that some people, through a combination of effort, luck, and in most cases privilege, wind up in positions of power and stability, and at a credit this strictly to their own work. And so this is patently false. If I'm a quiet developer. I'm very happy with my job. I'm super, super lucky. I am never going to tell someone to go pick up themselves by their own bootstraps because that ignores the experiences these people are having. So instead, it's time to work to try to make the experiences people are having better. Um, so let's talk on that note about empowering quiet developers after I get some water. Awesome. So there are a lot of tips here that we can use both as managers, colleagues, and also some of these tips translate really well for junior developers, which I never hear people talking about what we can do for junior developers. So like read it in both lens. Um, another caveat though, apparently, <laughs> number three, um, to engage and empower quiet developers, participation in specific communities should never be a goal and it should never be a requirement. 
We want to engage people, but let them make their own autonomous choices about their careers and judge their own safety without having to justify it to their employer. Why? Well, I just, that's what I pretty much just said, yeah. If we ignore an employee um, when they don't feel safe, then we're directly endangering them. Instead of labeling an employee at fault, we should ask why the platforms and venues make our individ or individual contributors feel unsafe. And when we do that, we actually work to validate the experience that someone is coming and sharing with us rather than questioning it. And doing this means we can start changing spaces for the better, or if we deem that impossible, we can begin creating these spaces ourselves. So how can we empower quiet developers in the workplace? I want to start with conferences, since we're at a conference, and since I'm about to go to a conference. Um, employers really love conferences as a way to expand perspective and contribute to building a career, but I don't think they're necessarily a good venue for everyone. First off, as an employer, never require conference attendance. Just don't do it. These spaces can be really overwhelming and in some cases, again, can be dangerous for some employers and can also put them in situations where they're going to have to out specific information about their health or life. And that's just not a good situation if you're a manager. Um, secondly, we need to demand that every conference that we or a colleague would attend have a comprehensive code of conduct. That code of conduct should be read by all attendees and protect people regardless of race, gender, age, sexuality, disability, or quite honestly, any other concerns that people raise. Um, for a world-class example, though, I have to say, we all checked out the code of conduct for this conference right here that Ash wrote and has been used to great success. So I encourage you all to print out a copy of that. Actually, that's probably really old school. Email a copy of that to your managers and just say, hey, this is a perfect example of what we need for all of the different spaces that we're going to when we leave this office. And, and by doing that, we can demand change and make sure that it is a requirement rather than an option to have a code of conduct. Um, two more things, especially at big conferences. Ask early and ask often about safe spaces for minorities. For example, last year's AlterConf MC Danielle James has been working really hard and at MongoDB World, we had a safe space for cis women and trans people of all genders. And that space allowed room to decompress, feel safe, express concerns, and share papers in a safer environment than they might have on the overall floor. Um, another that's one of my favorite things is AA. Um, organizing a daily AA meeting or providing local information about the group tells me as a sober person that the conference organizers have considered the relationship between the conference itself and alcohol, and that is almost never the case and is really, really alienating. So when I see that, I know that people are doing a good job. Um, a second action that you can take. If you don't know what spaces you should be supporting, ask the employees and what resources would be best helpful for them. But keep in mind, this is a sensitive subject. So asking anonymously is probably a good idea to ensure that nobody is pressured to disclose personal information. Um, next, let's talk about open source. And <laughs> that is the empty slide because I have nothing in open source. Um, but Let's consider it more directly. Let's create open source repos in our own organizations. And what I'm talking about like this is to abstract out tools or common patterns that you find yourself using with your colleagues and open up repos that are owned by your colleagues and yourself. That way, quiet developers who would normally not want to work with open source directly now can give their PRs to people who already review their code on a regular basis, already know how to safely converse with them, and who, if there are problems that come up, you can address with your own company. That gives you a lot more power than when you pick a random open source repo that you've never heard of, and suddenly there's no accountability for the owner of that repo at all. Um, plus, the bonus of this is if people do choose to do this, people can build up a large public footprint of open source work without ever having to have experienced that fear, um, which would be great. Yeah, I'm trying to do that right now myself, but I'm pretty bad at it. Um, and finally, let's celebrate the achievements of quiet developers in the ways they wish to be acknowledged. Um, one of the best questions I've ever gotten in a one-on-one -on -one in my life from a manager was just how do I prefer to be recognized for my work? And that's such a great question and gives really useful information to managers. In my case, it was primarily quiet one-on-one -on -one and maybe occasionally publicly in depart department meetings, but mostly by me demoing work rather than people talking about me. It just makes me really uncomfortable sometimes. Um, not everyone's like this, and that's why it's so important to ask. But once you know what form of validation is comfortable and welcome for employees, you should then ensure that that validation is provided regardless of how visible the work or project is. In doing so, you're essentially ass asserting a space that a quiet developer can inhabit in rather than allowing the walls of that space to collapse in to provide for more loud, visible employees. 
Um, so on my team, we have a few weekly and monthly meetings for education initiatives, and this is another situation where quiet developers' voices can get stomped on. Um, inevitably, the content of these talks and luncheons are led by the most vocal senior engineers, and um, quiet developers like myself find ourselves in situations where we need to assert our needs over the needs of more experienced and visible colleagues. So I would say consider democratizing the subject of the trainings that you're running. Anonymously ask people, yet again, to submit options and rank how important these are to them. And if there are options important that might not be the most glamorous new topic or library, prioritize creating space for covering these topics anyway in a voluntary synchronous space, or if you'd rather, an asynchronous space by making some training materials. Um, this may seem like it might alienate louder, more experienced developers who want to learn the next great thing, but instead I would say this is a perfect opportunity to tap into those people and encourage them to take a leadership role in training other people rather than focusing exclusively on learning as part of their career. Um, and plus, if you want, you can totally record these types of sessions so that even shy people like myself can review them at my own pace without having to worry about embarrassing myself halfway through the presentation. Um, so then from all of this, we've talked about hiring, we've talked about helping manage quiet developers, and we can go from here into asking some of the bigger questions, like how do we re redefine community? I know this is a lot, but I want to dream bigger and extend this into a larger conversation, more than just a 20-minute talk here, but things that we actively are thinking about. Um, so how might we actually think about community and software development and change that? Well, strong opinion time. There is no such thing as a global open source community. The set of all GitHub contributions are no way accessible equally to everyone. Language barriers prevent this, and I specifically mean like English language barriers because there are more developers in the world that do not speak English than speak English. And so already, if a contribution is through English only, you're alienating the vast majority of all engineers. And then how many of us have also opened an issue on GitHub before to have it rejected for a personal or hostile way? I will say that that has happened to me many times, which sucks. I've had people flag bad or issues as bad ideas. I've had those owners then find my Twitter and other social media accounts and start to flame me and tell everyone how I'm a horrible software developer and that I'm inferior and should not have my job. And the only change I was advocating was that someone's docs started out by saying, talking about the user's beard. And I wanted to say, hey, not all users are cis men with beards. Like, we can maybe take a, find a better joke to use for this. And that led to a week and a half long of harassment. So um, instead, I would say, though, there are multiplicities of communities in open source and beyond, the majority of which are largely invisible to people outside of them. And let's see, by limiting our views to only one community, like the most visible, we inherently erase the presence of others so next time you pick metrics like how many stars a repo have, instead consider that most repositories and communities care about their own work and may just not be talking about it with other groups. Um, let's take a moment and look at some behaviors that contribute to marginalization of communities and then afterwards parallel actions that help empower instead. For these examples, I want to make sure that I'm clear that I'm explicitly talking and speaking to actions taken by someone in a position of power, because marginalized people's actions, especially actions of resistance, cannot oppress heteropatriarchal power. Basically, too long didn't read, there's no room in this room right now for reverse racism, reverse sexism. We're not going to waste our time with that. Judging someone, <laughs> right? Yeah, I feel that way too. Um, Judging someone based off visibility within a dominant community or culture marginalizes these. It then others them and makes them the outsider and us the insider and immediately assumes that as outsiders, they are expected to learn about us and approach our community at the expense of others, including their own identities. Um, on the flip side, instead of judging individuals based off the relationship to your own community, consider individuals' relationships with their own communities. View yourself as the outsider instead and ask how you can actively learn from others. By allowing individuals to label themselves and treating them as experts in their own lives, we can empower them and their autonomy, validate their experience, and then stop validating their experience against our own. Um, finally, if someone doesn't engage with us, it's time to ask some difficult questions. Does our community make others feel unsafe? And how can we make new contributors feel safe and empowered? And I want to just say these are hard, vital, open questions. And it's not okay to put the onus on quiet developers or any marginalized group to answer these instead of answering them ourselves. And again, marginalized people are not responsible for dismantling structures that oppress them. But these are important questions that all of us can consider 
and that we aren't here just to be answered once. They're meant to be asked constantly because our work, much like our resistance, is never ending. So thank you so much. Um, my name's Sean Hansen. You can follow me on Twitter, Medium. And I just also wanted to give a big shout out to Ash, who did a ton of work along with all the volunteers here, but also helped me out with some of my slides. So thank you so much. <laughs>